Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, R&D Efforts in Energy Storage Technologies for the Grid at Pacific Northwest National Lab. I'm Shannon Reed, the Director of Community Engagement for the Electrochemical Society. This is the first webinar in a series organized by the ECS Pacific Northwest section. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in the webinar. Please make sure that your microphone is always on mute. This will alleviate any feedback or interruption from the audience during the presentation. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to the presenters by typing your questions into the GoToMeetings chat section. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect the questions and do our best to respond to them during the Q&A session after the presentation with time permitting. If we run out of time for the Q&A, we may post an ECS blog with answers to the most asked questions. As I mentioned, this webinar is the first in a quarterly series offered by the ECS Pacific Northwest section. The ECS Board of Directors chartered the Pacific Northwest section on October 16, 2020. The section formation provides opportunities for scientists and engineers from Washington State, Oregon, and Iowa to connect with researchers and participate in various events. Dr. Jay Zhao, ECS Fellow and Battery Division Secretary, took the lead in the chartering of the section and currently serves as its chair. The remaining officers of the section executive committee are the vice chair, Professor Corey Cobb from the University of Washington, the secretary is Dr. Yun Li from Microsoft Corporation, treasurer is Profan and Shannon Bolcher, University of Oregon, and the members at large are Dr. Jerome Babata, Dr. John Trella, and Dr. Yu Yan Xiao. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jay Zhao, the chair of the ECS Pacific Northwest section. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, hello, everyone. As a section, we are uh, working to organize at least uh, two events per year. Uh, quarterly seminars open to the whole world, monthly seminars for Pacific Northwest section. So you can see the schedule on, the, uh, on this uh, slide. Um, we are also uh, proposing to uh, organize an industrial day uh, in early May, where the attendees can look for jobs in electrochemistry and build their own network with industry. Uh, the current slide shows an upcoming event of the section. This effort uh, promotes extensive interaction and collaboration among universities, industry companies, and national labs. It also increases uh, student and the researcher interest and involvement with the section. And uh, I also have another good news uh, for all of us that uh, ECS is uh, helping our uh, section to establish an electrochemistry research award and student award uh, to recognize uh, scientists in our three states, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho who made um, outstanding contributions to the field of uh, electrochemistry. More details regarding how to apply for these uh, awards will be announced very soon. Now, please uh, allow me to introduce the webinar speakers, my colleagues, Dr. Wei Wan and Dr. David Reed. So Dr. Wan is currently our Director of uh, Energy Storage Materials Initiative a multi-million dollar and multi-year project uh, at the PNL to fundamentally transform energy materials research and the development through a physical informed data-driven approach. He also serves as the chief scientist and the technical lead on uh, stationary energy storage R&D at the PNL which covers a diverse portfolio of uh, redox flow, lithium ion, and sodium ion batteries. Dr. Wan joined the PL in 2009 after receiving her, uh, his uh, PhD in uh, material science and engineering from College Mellon University. Dr. Reed on the right side is a chief material scientist and program manager in the battery materials and systems group at the PL. Before joining PL in 2010, he worked in industry at 3M uh, US and uh, Praxa US. 
um, Dr. Reed researched in areas including high temperature electrochemistry, material synthesis and processing, alternative manufacturing methods, dielectric materials, coatings, failure analysis, new materials development, design of experiments, and rapid commercialization processes. His primary focus at the PNL has been developing and testing new materials and components in electrochemical devices. Dr. Reed is currently the program manager of uh, the DOE Office of Elect Electricity sponsored program focusing on new electrochemical device technologies for energy storage. He's also program manager for several industrial sponsored programs. Dr. Reed received his um, PhD in ceramic engineering from the Missouri University of Science and Technology. Uh, without uh, further ado, uh, let's get started. Uh, today's webinar will cover first overview of uh, grid energy storage technologies being invested at the PNL. Second is a new research directions in integrating experiment modeling and the data um, analytics. So again, we welcome your questions. Please send them in at, at any time during the webinar using the uh, chat feature. Presenters will try to answer as many as questions as possible at the end of the presentation. So now I will hand the webinar over to our speakers, Dr. Wei Wan and Dr. David Reed. Again, thank you. Um, thank you, Jay. Um, again, my name is David Reed. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of a kind of an overview, um, kind of go into a lot of the, the different programs that um, that uh, we have here at PNNL looking at um, not just uh, the, the technologies, but also a little bit of the safety and reliability testing that we do. And um, and this is this is all uh, sponsored by um, through the Department of Energy Office of Electricity. So it's really uh, its purpose to accelerate, you know, accelerate um, the amount of uh, storage technologies that we can get on onto the grid. So the next slide, um, so really what the program mission and the strategy is kind of what I was just talking about is to accelerate the development and adoption of energy storage. Um, and, you know, it's between the generation and demand, but giving the grid greater flexibility and resiliency. So, so this program, um, again, uh, sponsored by the Office of Electricity, it's, it's team, we team with uh, Sandia and Oak Ridge National Lab. They're the, the other two national labs that uh, work with us very closely. And we also work very closely, obviously, with industry, states, utilities, a lot of universities also that we have collaborations with. Um, it has a broad range of R&D um, deployments. So we look at things in the basic material science. Uh, we build devices, uh, systems, and then do analysis. It could be economic analysis, it could be performance analysis. And we have, um, we have uh, many national collaborations and we also have some international collaborations. And just to give a, um, a shout out um, to our program manager on this is uh, Dr. Emmer Zhuk. Okay, so how how the program is kind of um, is, is is kind of divided up here is what you see is there's kind of four silos, or um, what do you what do you call it, buckets that the first one is the cost competitive technologies and then safety and reliability regulatory support and industrial acceptance. What I'm going to go over today is, 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 is more in the cost competitive, and you can see I have that outlined in red. That, that'd be the next slides I'll get into. And then I'm also going to go into a little bit of safety and reliability. Um, the regulatory and industrial acceptance we, we also do, but I just, um, just for timing purposes, we're just going to go over the first two, uh, first two today. So, so how I'm going to, how I'm going to uh, do this in the next couple of slides is I'm going to go through each technology a little bit and just kind of highlight the things that we're doing, maybe a slide on each one, just to give you a feel for, for the things that we do. So on the first one, what you'll see is um, in the cost competitive, uh, one of the biggest ones, in, you know, obviously is lithium ion. We, do, we don't do the development in the lithium ion on this one. We have a group, someone that, that Jay's kind of the, the, the manager of, of most of that. And there's obviously a lot of work um, being done on lithium ion, lithium metal development, but we don't do that on, on the grid, on the grid project here, but we do a lot of reliability testing on the lithium ion for grid applications. So, and then the next bucket is I'm also gonna talk about is the safety and reliability. And then, um, and then uh, uh, so so we'll jump into the, what, what the cost competitive technologies, 
what we're looking at is um, obviously we're looking at different materials and the performance. How do, how do we improve the performance of different materials and different devices? And at the same time, can we lower the cost? So some of the key, the key technologies that we're looking at are novel flow batteries, um, sodium ion, sodium metal halides, zinc manganese, uh, and also lead acid batteries. So they're not only all, they're not all new technologies, some are, some are um, very um, mature technologies like lead acid, but we're doing things to try to improve um, the understanding and, and reduce the degradation. And I'll get into that in a couple slides. So if, if you're familiar with uh, some of the work that um, uh, PNNL has done in flow batteries, you're probably familiar with um, uh, a lot of work that's been done, a lot of really good work uh, that's been done on vanadium flow batteries in the past. Um, and I don't know if, um, if Wei is going to talk about, he, he might talk about both of these, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But obviously there was a, a lot of great work done on um, electrolytes. And we have a mixed, a mixed acid electrolyte, but also a... Um, um, a binary, uh, um, a, 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 a two, two electrolytes they were doing, and they, they are actually being commercialized by different companies and things now. So what we've done is we've now used, um, there's always the, the issue with the cost of vanadium being high. And, and so what, what Wei and his team are doing now is they're looking at aqueous soluble organics. So these are things that, again, um, major constituent is water, so they're high safety, early, um, easy thermal management, and actually very nice progress right now on this. So it's getting close, um, running at high current densities, still stable, um, it's easily to recycle, and the, the great thing about the flow batteries is, is you can decouple the power and the capacity. So I think we we'll get into this a little bit more, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we do have some really good collaborations here too. We work with Harvard, um, University of Southern California, Colorado University and, and also a couple of national labs here in Argonne and Lawrence Livermore. So it's a, it's a really nice um, nice project. And again, the, the, the real drive here now is, is, is to get the cost down a little bit. And obviously with uh, performance and stability with time. One of the other projects we work on um, is a sodium ion battery. And we've been probably doing this for it's probably been five to seven years really focusing on um, on this and looking at anodes and, and, and cathodes. Again, trying to get the performance up, getting the cost down. Um, but some really um, nice significant uh, uh, results we've uh, achieved lately is is a cobalt-free low-cost cathode, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's really like a sodium manganite structure and then it's doped with different transitions and it's getting you know, really good uh, capacity retention. You know, and it's and it can com and it can start to potentially compete with the the lower end lithium ions in terms of cost, um, well, in terms of cost and performance. And then the uh, the other thing that we're we're working on a lot now here too is uh, is the high energy anodes for this for this system. So some of the different places we're working with collaborations, we work with Penn State and um, and also Oak Ridge National Lab. So another program is um, a sodium metal halide batteries. So when you think of um, the sodium metal halides, often you think of the sodium sulfur, where it's a tubular, tubular, tubular type, or the zebras, where they operate at, at high temperatures, you know, 280 to 400 degrees. This, this project is actually looking at um, a planar intermediate um, materials using beta alumina, and then they're stacked uh, more in, in a planar stack. And the reason, um, and really good work here too. And if you go in the literature, we you you can find a lot of a lot of this uh, this work is done is by reducing the temperature, of the chemistries, and, and the temperatures where we can slow down that degradation and, and essentially almost um, uh, limit limit it. And um, we can also use polymer seals, which is, is which is a nice breakthrough. Rather than using glass seals, we can use polymer seals. And um, Using this kind of structure, a planer, we can um, we can go after and, and reduce manufacturing cost. So some of the collaborations we have here again is Penn State, but we also um, the Research Institute of Industrial Science and Technology out of uh, out of South Korea. So another technology. So this is one of the newer ones I would say in the last uh, two years. So um, zinc manganese manganese oxide battery. You know it's uh, we traditionally think of this as a primary battery, but we're looking at this as, um, you know, as, as uh, recycle, uh, rechargeable. So, so it obviously has some issues that you're probably mostly aware of is dendrite growth and, um, you know, manganese dissolution and irreversible phases, delamination, those kind of things. So 
so what we're doing is we're um, obviously we're interested in this because it's it's lower cost earth abundant chemistries you know can you can recyclable ours is actually in a mild we're using a mild acid a lot of people are focusing on the alkaline system but uh, we're, we're looking at the mild, mild acid and obviously we're, we're interested because of the large uh, volumic uh, capacity of zinc so so some of the things that we've done in this and you'll see maybe some things coming out in the literature soon is we, we have been focusing on the anode uh, trying to reduce the uh, the dendrite growth and coming up with some unique uh, electric deposition techniques, and then also looking at the cathode. And um, I guess it's kind of a little bit of a shout out. What what PNNL is really good at is we have a lot of really good analysis techniques and people that analyze things. So what we do is as we find the mechanisms, then um, we use the analysis techniques that we have on site here, and we propose alternative materials or structural enhancements how do we how do we dope this different and things like that so it's a nice combination of people um, and analysis people but also material scientists and then the collaborations here is um, we actually work with uh, West Virginia University and also case Western on some of these so an interesting uh, other technology that we've started in the last couple of years is looking at the lead acid battery you know and this is obviously this is a very mature business but it um, what you find is you, you get into this and we work with people, the, um, the lead acid manufacturers, and they've actually reached out to us and to Argonne. The, the last slide now in kind of, terms of um, the cost competitive on a project together is the issues with, um, there's a lot of additives and there's a lot of things that go into these, these batteries and they're not, there's not a lot of understanding of what what they actually do. So we're 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 looking at a lot of things, um, the degradation mechanisms, the solvation chemistry, and and what are the roles of those things. And once we understand that, then we can try to enhance um, and slow down that degradation, and obviously open it up for um, more more applications for the uh, station energy storage applications. And then, kind of the last. This is the probably the newest program area that we're looking at, and I think you'll see over the next um, couple years, you'll see there's a lot more emphasis getting into, especially long duration storage. I put these both together, seasonal and long duration, is kind of to develop. You know, we we want to keep it. It's it's got to be a pretty novel system, low cost, and obviously it's got to be reliable. But for long duration, we're looking at things of, of greater than 10 hours, you know, up to multi-days, right? Um, for seasonal, we're looking at things where um, you can actually charge it, you know, set it aside for a while, and then whenever you need it, if it's an emergency or if it's seasonal, um, then then you can use it. But the, the trick with that one is is to show minimal degradation over long periods of time. And we have some things that we're working on there, um, some IP, so I, I can't really go into too much detail on that right now, but um, it's an exciting area that, um, you know, both, both of these. And what we're really trying to look at is it kind of keep the cost low, right? Abundant, readily available materials, obviously safe. And then, as I said, for the seasonal materials is minimal degradation over long periods of time. So it can sit in that charge state for long periods of time and then when it's needed on demand. And then potentially have some um, maybe portable, and that would be for emergency situations, obviously, for the, um, for the seasonal material. So this is going to be kind of, I think, the, the last. We do we do do a lot of prototyping and scale up. So we don't um, just do all these small little button cells and things like that. So um, in the in the in the, the figure on the on the left for the flow batteries, you can kind of see the evolution of um, on the right there that picture. That's a that's about a ten square centimeter or five square centimeters um, sample of active area. And we we typically start there even when we're doing we were doing the vanadium. Now we do the aqueous soluble organics. But as we finish uh, and we do our milestones every year, we end up in the sample, a sample size that's on the left there. That's about 800 square centimeters. That's something that people that are commercializing this, this is, this is relevant size to them. So they're 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 interested in that. And we typically all of our milestones every year, we end up in that uh, in that size and do um, a multi multi stack uh, sample for. Um, for analysis. We also do a lot of cost analysis on this, you know, what are the components on there, you know, obviously if you if you run to higher current densities, things like that, how, 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 do, how do, what are the trade-offs there? So we do a little bit of an economic analysis too. 
Uh, the two samples on the right there, um, sodium ion and sodium metal halide, were also obviously interested in scaling these a little bit. The sodium ion, we're just starting this year um, doing some pouch cell development, um, getting some good results now. And then also, so the sodium metal halide, um, we've uh, traditionally worked a pretty pretty small, more of a button cell, like maybe a, a, th a three square centimeters. But um, in the last year or two, we've we've actually gone up to much much larger areas. So something that's more, again, uh, close to what you would commercialize something at. And so it's it's more of a sixty square centimeters. And again, here the collaborations we're um, working with J Bill. J Bill helps a lot on the, the flow battery design, and also um, again the uh, wrist out of uh, South Korea. So I'm going to transition a little bit into um, the safety and reliability now. So that that's kind of what I what I just gave there was kind of, is kind of um, you know a high high level of what kind of different technologies we're looking at, um, who we work with, a lot of collaborations, how we're trying to accelerate in, um, on, on the actual technologies themselves. Now the next, next section here is gonna be um, how else do we support all those technologies or getting things on the grid? How do we do that uh, in terms of safety and reliability? So again this is this is we use a lot of things you know evaluation protocols materials systems designs and um uh try to try to understand and just just to make that systems those systems that are going out there safe and more reliable and i'll get into a lot more of uh, some of these figures and um, who we work with and and uh and the things we're working on in the next couple slides here so a big a big emphasis for us is actually codes and standards. So historically, we've we've done a lot of work on safety uh, codes and standards, but we've also added, you know, in the last couple of years, uh, reliability codes and standards, um, IEEE standards, and also performance standards. So that's that's good to see. It's just kind of um, as 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 the markets um, as it matures, uh, there's obviously more and more things that we have to worry about. So, so in terms of the safety, you know, this is obviously supporting safe de uh, deployment of energy storage systems in the, in the electric grid. So, we have someone here that, um, if anyone's familiar with Matt Pace, is uh, kind of leading this. Um, it's everywhere from the design all the way to the decommissioning. You know, he they look at fire codes. Um, you know, even even um, fire protection systems. So it's uh, there's a there's a there's a lot here, um, but he also does a lot of outreach and education. So um, he he often comes and and uh, will give tutorials and um, and things like that. So the the second one is is a reliability. I'm calling it reliability codes and standard. Is this is um, supporting the development of the IEEE 1547. So that's this is the interconnection standards. So it's where um, you have some distributed resources and how you how you connect it to the the, the energy storage and this this is this is um, extremely important. This is being led um, in our in, at PNNL by Charlie Vartanian. So again, he he does a lot of these things and, and there's also a lot of outreach and education uh, that he also does for this. And then the last the last one, performance um, uh, uh, codes and standards is just trying to develop um and we're doing this uh, if you see this nema standard that is a that is a, a national standard but the other one the iec tc 120 is an international standard so we're doing not just the national but also the international and, and this is really looking for uniform ways to measure right you have different different energy storage technologies but just just to making sure that we can compare kind of apples to apples and then obviously we work with sandia very closely on this so to get into the highlight, one of the one of the things that we we spend a, a lot of time and effort on is, and, and, and we've done this in the past couple of years, is um, reliability testing. Like I said before, we don't do um, um, actual development of the lithium ion in this in, in our in this group that's sponsored by the Office of Electricity, um, but we do a lot of testing of uh, cylindrical single cells. And as it, as you'll see in the next couple of slides, we also do it on modules, which has many many um, uh, single cells in it. So what we're what we're doing here is is to try to quantify, disseminate, and then use use this research um, related to degradation and aging. So try to um, we do some accelerated obviously uh, degradation studies, and we're trying to in, in understand the impact. So we 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 apply various um, duty cycles that are being used and developed on the grid. So they're they're seeing kind of you know. 
um, frequency regulations, things like that, and then trying to develop some standard protocols for uh, for industry. Um, and then ultimately, um, when we test this, uh, we're trying to develop the, a state of health model. So I would say that the, the big picture of what we do on these single cell testing of, of the lithium ion chemistries, um, what you see on the, on the left here is some data analysis. So you can see there's LFP and NMC and NCA. So there's different chemistries. Um, we do that analysis, sometimes the DVDQ type analysis where we can understand where um, where that degradation is coming from. Is it the anode or the cathode? And then again, we have really good analytical uh, tech techniques and, and people support people here where we try to pinpoint and, and figure out where um, what, what is happening in there, and then we can understand the degradation mechanism. So this, this helps in, you know, obviously lifetime predictions, but also the state of health monitoring, and then also just to give the, the big pictures of how is the chemistry, the microstructure, and how does that relate to properties as a function of time. Okay, um, another, a little, um, I shouldn't say a little, but another um, project that we have that looks at degradation, and this is, um, like I said before, we're, we don't do as much on the vanadium in, in terms of development, but we, we are um, looking at um, uh, understanding how, how things degrade in here. So this is a kind of an international project. We work with Canada, uh, uh, NRC out of Canada and also Fraunhofer. And then um, an example of this is developed um, a really stable reference electrode. So um, what we're able to do is during, um, before, during testing and, and running of this, we're able to, to isolate out the anode and the cathode from each other. And then what we do is we're, we're stressing things. So we're putting or applying a little bit more voltage or higher current densities or um, starving things and changing temperature. So we're able to, we're able to stress it and see what, what component of that, um, uh, of that, of that flow battery is starting to degrade faster. And then one of the, one of the other ones, I would say this, to call this out, this is one of the big things that we've been working on the last couple of years is we have developed and um, we've established a, a reliability test laboratory for, um, for grid type um, energy storage applications. Um, we probably, we have the capability now that, um, so, so what, it, what it's doing is it's providing independent validation. So if someone, um, obviously this is nothing that we, uh, we make on button cells or modules. These are all commercially available materials that come in. Sometimes they're pre-commercial and the purpose is to, to really accelerate the development right, of these grid energy storage technologies. So again, it's, we're collaborating a lot and accelerating this. Um, and then we can also, as I said, not only on the single cells, but we can also provide uh, testing on the module levels. So it's somewhere in the order of about five to 10 kilowatt. So it's about a four, say it's a four hour system. That's about the maximum size we're working on right now. So again, it's, this is, it's equipped to safely test single cells and modules for all existing and emerging technologies. And again, it's for sizes up to about uh, 10 kilowatt. And I'll show you at the end here, we have in plans in the future, obviously to go even much bigger than that. So, but you can see some of the pictures on the right, um, they're getting to be um, larger. I mean, some of them are flow, flow batteries, but um, we're testing those that are, that are commercially available. We're testing iron nickel, um, some lead acid, um, obviously lithium ion is still in there. And, and you can see a lot, of, a lot of the collaborators and partners that we have in these systems. Um, so we're always looking for, um, you know, people that are coming out with have, have new ones if they need uh, independent validation and, um, Hopefully it's something maybe we could we could work with you on. So the the last, I'm going to go over a couple last couple of projects that are kind of um, I'm not going to say they're different they just they um they're they're exciting they just fit kind of a different um, different area. This one is um, grid integration of marine renewable energies. So we have a facility over in uh, Squim. So it's over on the coast um, on the western side of Washington, and. What we're doing is we've um, obviously bought the um, um, uh, the energy storage device, so we're integrating this into the marine power and, and the energy storage system, right? And then Charlie Charlie Vartani, the one that's working on the IEEE 1547, he is going to comply with the electric utilities that integration standard for that. So this is an exciting project. This is probably it's going to be in the in the summer here where we we'll start to get everything. Um, 
coming in and going a little bit faster. And then the last, the last one that I'll go over today too is um, this is a second use ba uh, bus batteries. So here is what we're doing is um, we're getting um, retired mobile packs from King County's fleet. So it could be their, their electric vehicles and or their hybrids. And what we're doing is um, kind of going through some test procedures, right? Obviously it, to try to re-rate these for station, station energy storage applications. So the size of the, the, the batteries is, is on, the, on the bottom right there. It's, it's a module. It has about, I think it has 90, 98 uh, cylindrical cells in it. Um, and then obviously we're, we, can, we have the capability to test 24 of these at a time. So we're trying to re-rate these and just, just to kind of give a, um, you know, obviously a better understanding of the cost and the benefits, right? Instead of just getting rid of these things, there's, there's often there's uh, a lot of uh, useful life back on these things for stationary use and then obviously provide some economical and environmental benefits. And then my last slide that I'm gonna go over is, I talked about, um, so in the future, we do, we do have some things. So this is um, uh, something that's exciting for, uh, I think all the people at PNNL is um, having, having a, new, um, a new building or uh, a, a new, um, this is called a grid storage launch pad or GSL. So it is, is off, it is obviously, it's a new building that's dedicated to grid energy storage. So, um, you know, the Department of Energy, you know, they identified, you know, they needed some accelerated development. So um, PNNL was selected, you know, in Richland, Washington as a, as a site for this. Um, and, and it also has, includes investment with the state of Washington, Mattel and PNNL, but the major, you know, big investment is from the Department of Energy. And as I said before, you can see, um, we can test in this facility, and it's gonna be planned to test up to 100 kilowatt systems, you know, four hour system, 400 kilowatt hour. Um, and again, this mission, and it, and it brings in, we've been talking about, so it fits very nicely where we're at now is, you know, is, is validating, right? Independent testing, and then accelerating, you know, we're working with others, and then, obviously collaborating, you know, bringing together DOE and, and research industry, and it, it helps lower the barriers to innovation and deployment. So, and this building is gonna be on the order of about 80, 85,000 square feet. So it's a nice size building and, um, you know, we're excited about it. And the last thing I'll do is just shout out, give a, um, a thank you for, obviously for uh, Dr. Imajuk, he's a DOE OE program manager. Um, we work again with a lot of universities, national laboratories, industrial collaborators. Uh, thank you for everybody there. Really great group of people, and and obviously the PNNL staff. You know the guys that are working on this every day. And uh, thank you for uh, for all your hard work. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, so we will um, have the Q and A session after uh, Wei's talk. Thank yep. you. David. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wei Wang. Thank you, Jay and the, the organizer uh, for inviting me to this uh, uh, talk. And I'm very happy to see that ECS have a uh, Pacific Northwest uh, uh, section, something we have longed for for quite a while for the, for the scientists, the engineers working in the electrochemistry uh, field. Uh, so uh, Dave has given an excellent uh, overview of what we are doing in the PNL for the energy Great energy storage, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of the example, the redox flow batteries, and go a little bit deeper. So what I want to show you is how we use the excellent uh, fundamental science research capability in PNL to advance the technology, to uh, really push them into the market to improve the uh, the performance and the cost, everything of the um, of the uh, uh, flow battery, some of the proof flow battery technology to move it to the market. And then the second part of my talk will be discussing the, uh, the f our future directions. If we are really going to say we're going to decarbonize our economy in the 20, 30 years of time frame, what do we need to be doing? So uh, Dave has given an a introduction of the flow batteries and the reason uh, we want to use it in the in the grid energy storage, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, one of the major challenges for flow flow battery, uh, apart from the cost, is a low energy density. They are normally around five to to ten times lower than the Nissan batteries in terms of the volumetric uh, density, uh, and the the formula on the right side 
shows how the energy density is calculated. In this formula, there are two parameters you can change. One is the C, uh, is a concentration of the active materials, and another one is V, is the voltage of your battery. So if we are going to change the V, we are really going to venture into the uh, long aqueous system. So today I'm going to uh, stay in the aqueous system and talk about how to increase this C as a concentration. So my uh, talk will be focused, the first half will focus on the developing high energy density electrolyte, and this started with understanding the solvation chemistry of the high concentration electrolyte. And it's not a trivial question. It's actually uh, exceedingly um, uh, difficult to understand what's happening in uh, in uh, one molar, two molar electrolyte, how the ions interact, how they interact with the salt ions. Uh, those all pose uh, questions and uh, risks for the stability of the electrolyte. So I'll be talking about that a little bit. And then we will, I will uh, briefly discuss the three strategies that we use to design the high performance uh, electrolyte. Include the uh, first is design of the contact iron pairs. And second one is disrupt the cluster uh, formation. And the last one is device preferential salvation. So I call them 3Ds. I'll be giving examples of the uh, different uh, redox chemistries we use in those three different ways to, uh, to improve their performance. Uh, so uh, my talk might be a little bit technical heavy, so I'll try to avoid using technical joggings, uh, but uh, uh, please uh, ask questions uh, anytime. Yeah. So the first one uh, I'm gonna use as an example is the vanadium electrolyte. Uh, the vanadium flow batteries that uh, Dave already mentioned. So for those of you who don't know the vanadium flow battery, it capitalizes on the four different valence uh, date of the vanadium. So on the anode side uh, and the alonite side, I should say, is uh, vanadium two and three and the vanadium uh, four and five on, on the cathode side. So it, during the charge the, on the cathode side, the four will be oxidized to five and on the uh, analyze side, the, uh, the three will be reduced to two and then vice versa. So one significant challenge for this electrolyte is the, uh, there are several uh, challenges, but one uh, very uh, prominent is the vanadium-5 will precipitate out at the high temperature. So that's why the traditional vanadium electrolyte is normally capped at 1.5 molar and normally can only be operated uh, uh, below 35 degrees. So that's why uh, during the summer it will require the active uh, uh, temperature control, meaning you, the system need to come with some sort of uh, air conditioning system, uh, increase the cost of overall systems. So we first try to understand the solvation chemistry of the vanadium 5 why it precipitated out. And the choosing here is uh, NMR data with a varied uh, temperature. You see the, when they when the electrolyte heating up and the cooling down, uh, it doesn't come up uh, on the same same route. So it shows that start, there's something happens with the bonding environment of the uh, of the vanadium. The oxygen NMR also shows a similar pattern. Uh, I'm not showing that here. Uh, so the first reason I identified this through the DFT theoretical calculation is that the vanadium four hydroxide uh, uh, after it at the high temperature, gain a little bit of energy, it actually will uh, go through a deprotonation process. It will kick out a proton and become a, a vanadium hydroxide. And this hydroxide will keep growing. Um, uh, uh, and this become the, the uh, this, this molecule become the seed for the continual growth of the lead work. And that we also identified using the uh, TOF SAMES. Uh, technology. Uh, so the picture on the left side showing this technology, basically we have the electrolyte there and then we uh, use the bismuth ion to bombard the surface of the electrolyte and then we use the secondary, uh, the mass spec to collect and analyze the secondary ions that generated from that, uh, that, uh, uh, that collision. So what we found here is this is a two molar 
uh, vanadium-5 electrolyte at uh, 50 uh, degree after uh, different times. So what we found here is in this electrolyte, there's actually a lot of higher order vanadium oxide, which basically means this, uh, uh, il, the, the, they say the elicit from the deprotonation started to uh, grow and uh, basically it started to dimerize and uh, trimerize and eventually form a clustering and eventually it uh, uh, become a crystal nucleus, goes through the nucleation and become a crystal precipitate out as a V2O5. So once we understand this uh, uh, precipitation uh, process, there are two points we can break it up to uh, sort of uh, change the direction of this uh, progress, progressive reaction. So one is we can somehow prevent the deprotonation. So prevent that seed from stocking. And second is even if it's started, uh, uh, started to dimerize or trimerize, we still can find a way uh, to sort of uh, disrupt the clustering formation. So that's a two, um, uh, two approach we can adopt, we adopted to generate, uh, to create the high performance vanadium electrolyte. So I will be giving you examples on how we did that. Uh, the first one is design the contact iron pairs. So this is uh, from our uh, mixed acid vanadium electrolyte. So the traditional vanadium electrolyte the end use sulfuric acid, is there, there was many years ago, there was a misunderstanding that uh, you cannot use HCl in the uh, in the in the vanadium electrolyte, which is not correct. So uh, from our study, what once we understand that this deprotonation is from the electron share between this water, this oxygen, and this vanadium, so it's pretty easy to come up to, uh, come up with a new strategy that we can in, we can introduce another anion that has uh, higher electron uh, negativity to uh, complexing with the vanadium. So in this way, the electron sharing will be between the vanadium and the chloride, and then the vanadium will leave this uh, water intact. And by doing so, uh, by introduce HCl into the traditional vanadium electrolyte, the mixed uh, acid the electrolyte increases the temperature stability about 80% and the energy density about uh, 70%. We can go as high as uh, 2.5 more and uh, uh, Temperature-wise, we regularly run at the uh, lab uh, over uh, at 50, 60 degree has no problem. And this is the technology that uh, we further uh, demonstrated in our kilowatt uh, flow battery demonstration lab and then uh, has been uh, licensed to several com uh, companies, include the UD Energy, also uh, in Seattle, our, uh, one of our the local Lost West companies and several systems has been uh, licensed. And the second approach is to try to disrupt the cluster information. So uh, once the depro deprotonation uh, process began and the, uh, the, the molecule started to uh, dimerize, trimerize, we still can find a way to disrupt that uh, clustering uh, from forming bigger clustering and then eventually uh, precipitate out. And this is the mechanism that we used to develop this bi-additive vanadium electrolyte. Uh, I, so I'm only gonna talk about how this electrolyte, uh, uh, how this additive improves the vanadium-5 stability. Uh, they, 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 the reason, uh, um, there's a history of the additive study for the vanadium electrolyte, but uh, many of them are not very successful. The reason of that is, the vanadium, uh, the four different uh, vanadium ions that behave uh, in opposite di directions regarding the temperature. Uh, they two, the two, three, four normally precipitate out at the uh, low temperature, while they, uh, they, the vanadium five precipitate at high temperature. So the single additive normally cannot achieve the the purpose of stabilize all the uh, electro uh, all the uh, active ions in the electrolyte. So that's why we uh, devised this uh, uh, bi additive uh, additive by a uh, bi additive uh, um, uh, combination of salt of the uh, ammonia hydrogen phosphate and uh, the magnesium chloride. So uh, this is a very complicated system. I'll I'll talk about a couple of the uh, the, the major points. So what we introduce here is actually introduce the anion of the uh, phosphate and the chloride to complex with the 
uh, vanadium uh, uh, ions, vanadium-5 uh, molecules, especially are the bound of the vanadium oxygen double bound where the electron density uh, is is high and it uh, have high intendance uh, to form the uh, to to be complexing with those uh, uh, anions and, and so uh, and the, the cations in this two sort actually does not form uh, contact ion pair it more function as a weak interaction uh, with the the uh, vanadium five uh, molecule to further uh, disrupt the clustering formation. So what we really did here is basically to have the have the uh, additive ions to form uh, a complex with the vanadium uh, uh, ions. So in a sense, to prevent the vanadium five ions to from higher form higher order of the clustering and uh, oxide to precipitate out. And the evidence is showing on this in situ Raman uh, Raman. Uh, uh, spectrum. So uh, it's also pretty complicated. What I'm going to show you is in a, uh, this peak around 800, if you can see on the wave frequency. So this is the study. It's a hump. This is a VOV bound in the solution. And uh, at some point, you can see it's split into two peaks. That's where it started to nucleate, to precipitate out from the uh, electrolyte. And you can see here, uh, on the B, the two molar vanadium-5 electrolyte without uh, additive is started to form around the probably uh, 200 minutes after the after the inception of the uh, uh, pretty into the 50 degree uh, of uh, furlis. And then the one with additive, it's actually not form not started to form until about the 2,000 uh, minutes. So it's uh, in the, you, you can see that with the additive, it delays the formation of the nucleation quite a bit. There's other information in this spectrum. I'm not going to jump into that. And another uh, evidence is, again, the uh, tof same study. So the black one is without, uh, uh, without additive, and the red one is with additive. What we find is you can compare the, uh, on, the, on the figure B, the green and the blue is without additive. You can see there's the amount of higher order of uh, vanadium oxide is a lot more than the one with additive, is, uh, especially at a higher temperature of 50 degree. Uh, the, the one with additive is represented by uh, yeah. Yellow and uh, and, uh, and the orange. So uh, so this electrolyte uh, compared with the pristine one increase. Uh, this is a solubility table showing that the by additive in the temperature from minus five all the way to fifty are stable. Uh, this uh, by additive electrolyte increase the temperature stability about eighty percent again, similar to the uh, mixed acid and the energy density about thirty percent. And this uh, technology also licensed for uh, several to several companies, and some of them even take it to higher temperature of 60, 70 degree. So the last D I'm going to talk about is the device prefer preferential or solvation. Uh, I'm going to use a long aqueous uh, uh, chemistry to illustrate trade to this point and uh, I'm going to later on also talk about this in the uh, aqueous system uh, aqueous organic so here uh, this is a, a research several years ago uh, when the long aqueous flow battery was just started uh, we tried to use the ferrocene which is a very well known uh, uh, redox molecule it gives you a, a very beautiful uh, redox uh, CV peak uh, but the problem is if we try to dissolve them in the uh, Nissan battery electrolyte, very common EC, PC, EMC uh, mixture, uh, solubility is very low, 0 0.04 molar. So what we find is if we uh, modify it with uh, um, quaternary arming as a, as, as a side arm and uh, then use the TFSI as a counter ions, uh, the uh, uh, solubility actually increased quite a bit, more than 20%, and 20-fold, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, so they, this is the NMR spectra showing here just the, the uh, solvent itself, and then the low concentration electrolyte, and then the saturated high concentration electrolyte. So what we find is a, a three different points here. The solvation peak uh, spacing doesn't change. It, it, it means there's no chemical bonding forming. 
But it, it does when we add the uh, ferrocene into the electrolyte, especially this modified one, we saw intensify of the uh, interaction between the solvent and the solute, uh, which, uh, which basically means that's how their uh, uh, solubility increase. And the increase is especially coming from this ionic arm and they, if you can say that the um, uh, uh, proton of one, two, three uh, on this ion ion ionic branch, that the uh, NMR shift is the most compared to the to the protons on the ring side, uh, on the rings, the shift on the arm is a lot more. So they basically what we did is we created a part of the ferrocene that interact a lot more than other parts. Uh, in this, uh, in its uh, solvent, and this point is further illustrated uh, when they, uh, when the guys did the study on the uh, uh, using AMR to to study their diffusion rate t uh, one t two times. Uh, I'm not going to this going this spectrus, but what we find is after we add this uh, ionic arm on the ferrocene, the electrolyte is sort of being picked apart. And what we found, we found is that the EC, EMC tend to stay on the ionic side, and then the PC tend to stay on the iron side. So in the figure, it, it was on the left side. So uh, in essence, that this, uh, uh, this modification actually uh, sort of created in homogeneity in the uh, solvent. The solvent used to be random and homogeneous. Hom uh, random mixture and totally uh, homogenized, uh, but after this uh, arm, uh, this creating this ionic arm because of the different uh, electron densities, it's actually created some type of uh, a polarity in the in the in the solvent. And this is some of the performance when uh, when we form a flow battery against the lithium metal. Uh, this at the time was the highest uh, uh, energy density uh, lithium uh, flow batteries. So uh, this is a so I talk about the mixed acid by additive and uh, ferrocene, and there's some other examples I didn't touch upon, the zinc iodide, and I'll talk about filling a little bit later. So to wrap up this section, that uh, how we use molecular engineering for high performance redox flow battery uh, electrolyte, we believe that the predictive understanding of the solvation chemistry of the electrolyte itself is very important that it will enable you to design. Uh, the, the approach is a plans to improve the uh, performance. Uh, and uh, through the preferential salvation, uh, we, can, uh, we can achieve that purpose uh, by different ways. For example, the contact iron pair and, uh, uh, and also the, uh, the by, uh, by creating uh, local, localized interactions, uh, the solubility can be increased. So the summary is actually pretty simple. So in this business, I would say the anisotropy is your friend. Uh, basically, if you want to improve the uh, solubility of the active materials, you need to create some types of uh, some sort of the asymmetry in the structure, either in the active material or in the solvent solution itself. So uh, that's the first part of the uh, my talk. I want to show you how we use this uh, fundamental science. Uh, and the cartridging to to generate the help us to generate a high performance uh, vanadium uh, uh, di a different uh, uh, redox flow battery electrolyte. And the second uh, issue, second uh, part of my talk is uh, what are we trying to do in the future. So uh, start of, well, for this uh, part, I'm going to tell you a story on how we. Uh, we did the, another development on the filizen, uh, which I showed uh, uh, the picture before. So the filizen it has a light redox peak again, but it does not dissolve in water. And so uh, what we did is we did a modeling of uh, with our um, uh, organic scientist to come up with seven different uh, uh, modification plans, seven different uh, derivatives. And then one of our uh, fantastic uh, uh, organic scientists, Aaron, uh, spent uh, quite some time to synthesize all of them and the characterize them and pick uh, the best one. And then we did the uh, uh, testing and we now are in this process of protein type, scale it up. 
And this research was published on the later energy. So this is a, this is a good story, right? It's, it's indeed is a good story, but what I want to tell you is this is not in good enough if we really want to say in 20, 30 years, we want to decarbonize our uh, energy sector. So I'm gonna uh, show you some comparison, okay? So in two years, we design and screen the eight molecule and develop the best one to the point of prototype, right? And uh, after eight years, I can tell you which one is the best among these eight molecules. And let's say you are 10 times better, you're 10 times uh, smarter than us, you can screen 80 molecules in two years, and then you are also richer than us. You have uh, 10 times of uh, more resource and headcount, so you can screen uh, 800 molecules over two years. And let's say there are 10 such groups uh, working on this same issue so they can collectively uh, screen 8,000 molecules. But here is a problem. So the low infinitum derivative is over 6,000. So after two years of 10 groups of the hardworking, you can probably tell us which one is, uh, which one is the best among all the fitted and derivatives. And furthermore, there's an even bigger challenge. Uh, this is one of the largest uh, small organic molecule database called GDB17. Uh, it contains 166 billion of molecules. Well, granted, not all of them are redox uh, active. We don't need to screen all of them. But I kind of give you the uh, cosmic uh, nature of our challenge. Uh, the chemical and material space we need to uh, screening is vast, it's gigantic. There's no way we can do it through the current try and error approach. And this is our internal problem, right? And then let's examine the uh, external problem. Now this is a, a, pr a prediction from the McKinsey and the Bloomingberg. Uh, the McKinsey uh, predicts NA to 2023 and Bloomingberg all the way to the 2039. So uh, in the prediction, it says, it, it predicted that by 2040, we need a 500 gigawatt hour of the energy storage. So equivalent to the capacity of 75 Hoover dams. And we're not even going to build one extra Hoover, Hoover dams. And if we assume uh, the average energy density at uh, the system level of the battery is about 100 watt hour per kilogram, uh, this translates to five million metric tons of the batteries that will needed to, uh, to to uh, satisfy this uh, uh, energy storage challenge. There's no current technology that can satisfy this uh, rapid growth of the uh, demanding. And then if we take a look at the performance level, uh, this is, uh, Jay mentioned this uh, battery 500 that in, also hosted in uh, uh, Ping IO, they're trying to uh, increase the energy density of the uh, transportation uh, battery. And on the grid side, all of those batteries, Nissan Man battery, different Nissan Man cathode battery, redox flow, they all need to make a big jump to satisfy the grid energy, uh, the energy storage target for the grid application. And we know for a fact that the energy density of the Nissan batteries that just won the Nobel Prize not too long ago was improved kind of less than 2% per year over the last 40 years. So the question is, we don't have another 40 years to, dissolve, to develop a new technology or, or, or multiple of new technology to satisfy the uh, market challenge. So this is basically what we're trying to address for, uh, from the energy storage uh, materials initiative in PNL. We basically try to ask two questions. The first one is, can we predict the material property even before we synthesize it? Uh, remember, uh, Aaron spent eight years, uh, uh, sorry, spent two months, uh, spent, sorry, two years to synthesize uh, uh, seven different uh, uh, molecules. And that's a very time consuming. So what we want to achieve, achieve is to say if we can by establishing a coordination between the material structure and the material property, can we, uh, before we even synthesize it, we can predict what, for example, it's, it's solubility. If we, our predict is very small, then we don't even need to uh, synthesize it. We can only target our synthesize on very promising molecules. 
So this needs to basically need to on the atomic, uh, uh, atomistic level need to collect uh, the molecule structure to its property. And we can do this by a data-driven uh, machine learning uh, approach. Um, and then the second question is, can we predict the device performance even before the assembly? Uh, you, you all heard the, the story, many story of the death valley of the startup companies, right? That take a, a laboratory developed uh, technology, uh, new energy material to the market and all of a sudden they find that it, it, it does not look like what they expected in the full cell in the whole system. So what we want to do is say, if we can at the laboratory level, we can rapid prototype in the validate, to validate the new materials or new technologies. And to do so, we need to link material pro uh, property and the device performance across a vast, that different skills, right? You have the single cell, you have full cell, you have stack, and then you have a whole system. So not only the spatial scale, but also the temporal scale, right? The small cell tests at several minutes and the system running at several hours. So we need to across those gaps. Basically, we need to collect the device functionality to the system performance. We also, we also, uh, we also want to achieve this by the physics-based data uh, modeling. So I think I probably a bit tight on the on the on the time. So uh, this is basically what uh, what uh, um, uh, this initiative trying to do is to create a digital twin to to collect from the material structure all the way to the system performance. And the digital twin might be a foreign concept to the research uh, community, but it's actually widely used in the in the in the uh, manufacturing uh, business. So it's basically a digital replica to the actual materials. And what ESME, this initiative trying to do is extend this concept all the way to the material discovery and the validation of the device. Uh, and so here is what we invented, what this digital twin will do for, we're using a flow battery as an ex, uh, example. So we are going to uh, achieve predictive material design to predict the, the organic material, uh, material properties before we synthesize them. That's the first uh, uh, thrust that we want to achieve. And second, we want to achieve the performance, uh, 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 prototype of performance validation. And in the end, we want to uh, get them all together to become the whole, uh, whole, a whole package of digital twin. So uh, I will briefly touch uh, what's the progress so far. Uh, it's turned out that if you want to use data science and machine learning, the first thing you need is data. The data is the currency of the uh, machine learning and AI. So our first uh, project as actually is to establish a, 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 a organic molecule database that includes the um, property of the organ redox active organic mo molecules include solubility, viscosity, but also the the, the, the descriptors at the quantum level. So we use high throughput uh, DFT calculation to calculate their, for example, the, the surface error, the, sol so, uh, the solvent accessible surface error and their boundedness, all different type of uh, 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 properties. So this, uh, uh, this database right now has uh, close to 20, 20 thousand in the different uh, um, uh, data sets. So I believe it's the largest uh, such uh, database in the, in the world. And we are not be able, we, we, we're not able to predict the solubility yet, but uh, we seem can do a very good prediction on the solvation energy now, which is the indication of the solubility. Now the graph kernel model that we developed it can achieve a similar uh, prediction using uh, uh 25% of the data that other methods need to use and to further expand our uh, database we actually uh, has recently installed two high throughput system those systems can uh, generate the combinatory material synthesize and also large scale uh, large scale high throughput uh, uh, property calculations that will further increase the not only the the quantity but also quality uh, quality of our data and on the digital twin side, we were able to demonstrate the first uh, multi-fidelity uh, machine learning models that are based on the physics informed Gaussian process. So uh, I'm going to just uh, introduce this a little bit. 
So you can see the traditional model, they cannot predict the tail of this discharge of a flow battery. And then with the, uh, the, this new model, even just the two data points, uh, we can actually uh, pretty accurately predict the flow battery performance of both charge and the discharge curves. So we are further developing those uh, uh, models and the databases. Uh, so that's kind of all I have. And uh, then it's my acknowledgement, of course, the financial support from the OE Office Energy Storage Program. And also the uh, initiative itself is supported by PNL's uh, laboratory directed research and the development. Uh, I did just want to give everyone a my heads colleagues, up. Many uh, of them, uh, the announcement regarding the different projects. Uh, and my, some of them are by the uh, past uh, uh, members. I think that's my last uh, slide. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Wei. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wei Wang and Dr. David Reed. Uh, due to the time limit, I think uh, maybe um, we can just answer a couple of questions. If you have uh, additional questions, please directly send your emails uh, to them. So there's uh, one question in the chat window. Uh, by using the by source additive in the vanadium electrolyte, will that change the solubility of the vanadium salts at different state of charge? Uh, that's a good question. It, it's not. So what we did was uh, we um, they, they all the different uh, uh, valence state they are all at uh, uh, two molar and then uh, we added the additive and uh, the make sure that they are all stable at that uh, same concentration. Uh, one last question. Anyone? Okay. Last call. If no, uh, let's uh, thank uh, ECS, thank uh, Dr. David Reed and uh, Dr. We won again. Uh, thank you everyone for participating. Shannon? Thanks, Jay. Um, just to round out the webinar, you know, I want to say thank you. Um, the webinar is a great, the webinar program is a great way to engage our community. We know that many of our members get started with ECS through biannual meetings and section events. So uh, having the Pacific Northwest section facilitate a quarterly webinar series is great. Um, you know, we have a lot of membership options for those people who may be new to ECS or new to the Pacific Northwest section. If you're interested in joining the Pacific Northwest section, please email me at shannon.reed at electrochem.org or you can email customer service at electrochem.org. Uh, as, as an announcement for uh, the attendees today, the uh, meeting scheduled for the spring in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, this meeting will be digital. Um, so uh, we will be doing a similar meeting. Uh, the June 39th ECS meeting will be similar to Prime 2020. Uh, registration will be opening in the next couple of weeks. I believe it's scheduled to open at the end of February or beginning of March. Uh, we have two other engagement opportunities. Uh, as far as meetings involved this year. Um, the second is gonna be the uh, SOFC Solid Oxide Fuel Cells Conference. Uh, this was originally scheduled to be in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, that has been announced that it will be digital. The abstract deadline uh, for this meeting is February 5th. So please make sure that if you're interested to submit your abstracts by the 5th of February. The other biannual meeting that we have this year, our fall biannual meeting, is scheduled to be in Orlando, Florida in October. Um, it's the 240th ECS meeting. Abstract submission is open and they are due on April 9th. Um, this meeting is still scheduled to be in person, but of course we'll keep an eye on um, uh, the pandemic and, and what's happening in the world to uh, keep the community updated regarding whether this is an in-person meeting or if that changes. In addition to the quarterly uh, webinar series that the Pacific Northwest is doing, um, there are additional ECS webinars as part of the ECS webinar series. You can learn more if you visit electrochem.org slash webinar, or slash webinars, excuse me. Again, I want to give a tremendous thank you to Dr. Jay Zhao for moderating the webinar and Dr. Wei and Dr. Reed for presenting. Uh, these types of events really help promote engagement with the section and help further the mission of ECS. Make sure to mark your calendars um, and check in for the Pacific Northwest section event occurring in February and April. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. The webinar is now over.